Okay. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, so the objectives are listed here. Um, I do have to disclose that I am not a pharmacology expert, but um, there are lots of new drugs coming to the market or being approved that have come to the market. And I think it's important that we stay on top of those new drugs because patients are going to ask about them. And I can't present all of them to you today. So I picked a few um, between the past year or so, uh, mostly last year, that I could talk about. And I decided I'm not just going to blurt out a bunch of new drugs to you. I want to go over what the current guidelines are and how they fit into those guidelines so that if you are going to utilize those new drugs, and when I say new drugs, it's kind of a loose term. Some of them are kind of old drugs that have been spiffied up a little bit, and we see that a lot um, of times. So the drug might be familiar to you, and there might be some slight changes. And so you'll say, oh, that drug is like, for instance, one of the new drugs is levoketoconazole. You're probably like, wow, I use ketoconazole, but now it's levoketoconazole. So an example of um, kind, of, kind of a spiffied up old drug that's now a new drug. So not going over all of the new drugs that have been FDA approved or that has submitted for a new drug approval, but just going over a handful so that you can keep abreast of some of them that have come to market. So also I decided to put them in a patient, a patient case format so that you can best apply these new drugs to your practice and to your patients as they come in. So let's look at our first patient. This is a 58 year old female that presents to your pharmacy. I guess for you guys, it will be your clinic um, to pick up her atorvastatin prescription or she's gonna refill her atorvastatin prescription. You ask her how she's doing on her med and she advises she's just frustrated at the lack of results seen from her atorvastatin therapy. So you kind of go to the treatment guidelines. Now let's see, do you wanna continue her atorvastatin therapy or is there some changes that you could possibly make with a new drug that was FDA approved? So this patient doesn't wanna be on any additional medication. So you try to add something, maybe Zetia or something like that. And she says, no, I'm done taking pills. I'm not taking any more pills. In looking at the American College of Cardiology um, and American Heart Association treatment guidelines, I know it's a review for you. I listed them here. Um, you can kind of see that the recommendations would be to add Zetio or maybe a phenofibrate to this patient. Let me go to the next slide. So this was a new therapy approved on December 22nd that might be an option for our patient. And it is called Leg Legvio in Clisseron. So this drug is now available for you all to give in the office or in the clinic. Um, it is going to be an injection that you could prescribe and give to that patient. And the FDA approval is for heterozygous familial hypercholesteremia or clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Basically, this is for a patient where her LDL is not controlled by maximum dose statin therapy. So if you have a patient, you're frustrated, their LDL is still not at goal, you may consider um, trying to get this type of therapy for your patient. If they're willing to take the injection a couple times a year, um, it may be an option. Special populations, no renal or hepatic dosage adjustment needed. It's not for use in pregnancy or of course, pediatric patients. The liver plays a key role in clearing LDL from the blood. And so this is a review for me. So I figured you all could benefit from it as well. Certain patients um, or certain proteins in the liver can interfere with the LDL uptake. Okay, so now if you recall, the more LDL receptors we have, the more LDL uptake and degradation of the LDL, it gets uptaked into the hepatocytes, which is, which is in the liver cells. And we can get that liver um, cleared out and we can get the LDL out of there. So then their LDL levels will be lower. So with this specific drug, okay, this is going to be an inhibitor 
of, of the PCSK9. The PCSK9, we don't want to be there because what that does is it gets rid of the LDL receptors, which we said those receptors were good at degrading the LDL. So we want those receptors around. So if this is a PCSK9 inhibitor, it doesn't allow for those LDL receptors to degrade or go away. It allows for more receptors, which allows for more LDL to be taken up and cleared out. So because this is a PCSK9 inhibitor, more LDL receptors get to stick around and more LDL is cleared out, which is good. Okay, so this is an indication as an adjunct to diet and again, maximum tolerated statin therapy. Um, so if you have a patient again, that's willing to take the injection, this could be an option for them, uh, but you should have exhausted the statin therapy um, and the patient should be willing to take that injection and is adherent and will come to the appointment and you're able to get that prior off, which is probably gonna be on their approved. So here's just a picture to show you the receptors are gonna clear out the LDL, making those arteries clear. And then we have an increase in uptake of the LDL. There are two current monoclonal antibodies on the market. And I listed them here, Preluent and Repatha. You may be familiar with them that you could have already prescribed for your patients as injections. These therapies have been shown to reduce LDL by up to 60% when used in combo with statins. So we know that there's benefit to these injection therapies. And so that's why these could be good options for your patients. Um, again, that certain patient population. Okay, so that's the first drug that we talked about. Oh, I do wanna go back because there's one thing I wanna show you that's significant. Let me just go back and I'm sorry. The cost, $3,250 per injection. Uh, but the nice thing about this one versus those other, other monoclonal antibodies on the market, this one for the first year, you do three shots. So every three months, but then it goes down to every six months. So only two shots a year. The Preluent and Repatha is every three months, every year. So with Inclisiron, you're only having to pay three shots for the first year and then only two injections every year thereafter. With the um, other monoclonal antibodies, it's three injections every year. So this one would cost less just because the number of injections decreases, uh, generally speaking. Um, and then also the patient would need to come into the office less times than if you use the other injection therapies for that patient. So it might be a better option for your patient if they say, well, I'm willing to do an injection, but only twice a year, not three times a year, as we're seeing with the other add-on therapies. All right, we have a 42-year-old female that presents to your pharmacy to pick up her ketoconazole. You're using this for a fungal infection, right? She lets you know. So you prescribe this medication, but you're prescribing the Cushing's off-label, not for a fungal infection. You're, you're prescribing it for Cushing syndrome, which we have seen it used time and time again, which is fine. Um, and we know that Cushing's is when someone makes abnormally high levels of cortisol, that's a review, that results in increased fatty deposits in the midsection, face, shoulders, and upper back. The Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guidelines, of course, would recommend tumor resection. So in a patient where tumor resection is not an option or not curative, we do have a new option that has hit the market December 30th, 2021, that might be an option for our patient called Recorlev or Levoketoconazole. 150 milligram tablets. You cannot use Levoketoconazole for nail or skin fungal infection. So if you're searching your e-scripts and you're trying to find an antifungal and this pops up for, for skin um, fungus, do not use levoketoconazole for fungal infection. You can still use the ketoconazole, but this one does not have safety data in that indication. So it's really important to not use that. 
Um, the initiate, initial dosage is at 150 milligrams twice a day with a high fat meal. And of course, that's the same because we have increased absorption with the azoles when we have a high fat meal. And then titrate the dose by 150 milligrams daily. So the FDA approval is for endogenous hypercholesterolemia in adult patients with Cushing's. So Recorliv was specifically FDA approved for Cushing's syndrome. And again, in surgery that has not been curative or is not an option for a patient. And of course, just like in all the other azole therapies, our patient would wanna have a clear EKG because azoles can prolong the QT wave. And then also our patient would wanna be 24 hour urine free cortisol collections every two to three weeks until an adequate, adequate clinical response is achieved. So you're probably wondering, well, does it affect um, the enzymes like we saw with the ketoconazole in the same way? Levoketoconazole is an, ent ent an antiomer of ketoconazole. And I don't know if you remember this from your basic chemistry or biology classes. This is a mirror image, but then there is an extra little um, on the chemical structure, an extra uh, little structure that makes it a little bit different. Um, it's a 2S4R, an antiomer of ketoconazole and an inhibitor of 11A1, 17A1, and 11B1, along with 21A2. So if you were prescribing Paxlovid, for instance, for COVID, this would probably be one of the ones that the patient would either need to stop taking or would be a reason to not prescribe Paxlovid um, because that would be something that could interfere with that medication, like we saw with the many other drug interactions that that medication had. So other medications used to suppress cortisol secretions are mostly, or mostly inhibitors of stereogenesis, um, ketoconazole, fluconazole, and then the list goes on. So I was really um, interested to find when I was researching this, what strides have they made in Cushing's other than adding another um, antifungal that we pretty much had ketoconazole as a treatment. I'm not sure that I would switch over to this new treatment in looking at non-inferiority studies other than it is FDA approved, which is great. So I found that there was a, a mutation, a new mutation that they found, um, and it's called the USP8 mutation. And basically what this is, is it's a mutation of the gene that we can actually identify um, called the ubiquitin specific peptidase, USP8, in a cell of the body. Um, and so, if we could prophylactically identify this mutation, could we then treat patients prophylactically for Cushing's who are at high risk? Uh, like we do, for instance, when we look for the HER2, right, in breast cancer, or could we stay away from certain medications or certain things, um, right? So I might stay away from like prednisone therapy if a patient has um, an increased risk with the um, cortisol levels, or um, something like that. And so more treatment is needed, but perhaps instead of chasing Cushing's, which is what we generally are doing now, if they find more information about this mutation, if we could treat it before it occurs, or if we know a patient's at high risk, I think that would be a really big breakthrough in science. So um, I don't wanna say that um, we definitely have identified that this mutation occurs, um, but I know that it is something that they've discussed. So to me, as I was researching this, I was really excited to find, oh, wow, we might be able to have this group of patients that we know are at high risk for Cushing's. That's really exciting. So again, um, it is not known if Recorliv is safe and effective for fungal infection. So I wouldn't recommend prescribing that, even though um, studies may come out where it has been proven effective or efficacious just um, like uh, ketoconazole is, so I wouldn't recommend using it. Um, and again, you would want to avoid it in patients with QT issues or liver problems. So if a patient comes in with um, arrhythmias or AFib or any kind of issues with their EKG, you would want to avoid that.
Okay, uh, ketoconazole is also used off-label as an androgen synthesis inhibitor to treat prostate cancer. Um, and so if this is just to let you know, there are significant issues with ketoconazole on the ISMP. So if you are using it for things, um, the patient could be at increased risk of rhabdomyolysis, um, which can result in acute kidney failure. And so just be cautious with that medication. Um, and, and this has nothing to do with Recorlev, but letting you know that ketoconazole has some significant issues. So make sure that if the patient's on statin therapy, they hold their statin therapy for that period of time. Um, Cause that's a lot of what I'm telling patients to do in the pharmacy, hold your statin therapy um, and don't take it until you're, you're over and done with the treatments for ketoconazole. Um, and oftentimes that gets forgotten when it's prescribed. Oops. There was also a safety announcement um, on the ketoconazole um, that the medication has serious liver damage, adrenal gland problems, and harmful interactions with other meds that outweigh its benefits. So if this was a medication that you never used for um, skin and nail fungal infections, I would be okay with that because it has some significant risks. So you may get a call from me in the pharmacy if you prescribe this because it is gonna flag as a major interaction um, in my pharmacy database. And at the pharmacies across the board, we all use the same drug interaction database and it would be the same that your Scripts electronic software uses as well. So if you're getting a major drug interaction that you have to override, I'm getting that same one as well. And um, again, in the pharmacy, I'm not seeing your override. In the hospital, I see that you overrode it and I can identify why you overrode it if you put a reason. But at the pharmacy, I don't have those means of communication. So I don't know why you overrode it or prescribed it if you do get a drug interaction. And that's why it would be sparking a call from the pharmacy and then a gap in when I can fill it and dispense it to the patient. Okay, the next disease state I'm gonna talk about is bacterial vaginosis. I don't know if you know this, but it affects about 21 million women in the United States. Um, and so it is pretty significant. And just to review, this is not an, a sexually transmitted infection. This is when we're replacing the normal bacteria flora vaginally with um, an anaerobic bacteria, which is basically bacteria that doesn't need um, the presence of oxygen to um, survive and thrive. And so the CDC treatment guidelines for bacterial vaginosis, all first line options are equally efficacious. So what that tells me is I have metronidazole, I have metronidazole gel, I have clindamycin cream, I have clindamycin ovules. So I was really excited when I was about to read this new drug therapy that came to market. And then my heart sank when I saw that it's clindamycin gel. We already have a clindamycin cream and an ovule, and now it's a gel. Um, great, because it's one more option. And if I don't have it in stock, I can call you and say, hey, can I switch with this to a gel? But I was kind of hoping it was actually a new therapy, right? So that was a little disappointing. The dosing schedule is 100 milligrams vaginally once. Anything once is excellent for our patients, right? Because we always have adherence issues. Um, it is FDA approved um, 12 years or older for bacterial vaginosis. Um, we don't know the cost yet. I'm sure it'll be a little bit costly while they still have you know, new to market. I actually can't order this yet. I know it was approved in December of last year, but it's not available to, to me to order in the pharmacy. And so sometimes they do press releases and I'm really excited like with Prevnar, right? I was really excited, it hit the market, um, but I couldn't even give it because I needed the CDC to approve it. And so sometimes they do press releases and it jumps the gun and I actually can't get it in the pharmacy. So I think that there's a lag time um, when patients see it and it's available and when I can actually order it and dispense it. Um, and of course, this hasn't been studied in pregnant women, um, but it does have low bioavailability, meaning the absorption because it's vaginal is fairly low. So there isn't any um, issues that we're suspecting that it would harm the fetus. So the benefits would outweigh the risks in this case because it's given vaginally. So most likely mom would be able to still use this if she's pregnant. 
Also, I think it's really important if you have someone coming in that is having sex, that you're gonna give them a vaginal cream, you let them know, this could um, cause a breakdown of the condom. And so you should refrain from having sex or use a backup method for duration of treatment and at least three days after treatment. That's really important because I think that we sometimes, it just slips our mind or we don't think about it. Why would someone have sex while they have uh, bacterial vaginosis, but people do. Um, and so it's important to let our patients know that. I know that you all know how clindamycin works, but just as a review, it's a water-soluble ester pro drug. It's then metabolized to the active clindamycin. So clindamycin metabolized to clindamycin. Someone was asking me that the other day, well, I'm allergic to codeine, but I'm not allergic to morphine. And I thought in my head, my organic chemistry days, right? Codeine is metabolized to morphine, the chemical structure. And then she tried to tell me like, but I can take morphine. But no, if you're allergic to codeine, I still don't want you to take morphine, right? Because you could still have that allergic reaction. Codeine is metabolized into morphine. That's part of the steps of the metabolization. So I still want you to be cautious. Um, and I never know what to believe when people say that in the pharmacy. So it's like the people that say, well, I can't have naloxone because I'm allergic to, you know, um, that one part I have to have um, the, just the buprenorphine. So, all right. Um, so the following single intravaginal dose, um, this was given to 21 healthy females and they basically found the peak occurred at six hours. So when people say, when will I feel better, right? Cause they're having severe pain and itching and it's uncomfortable. Sometimes in the pharmacy, we want to tell them 30 minutes, but really we shouldn't say that because the peak that they're identifying is in about six hours. So we should really say a day to be safe. Um, clindamycin in inhibits bacterial protein synthesis. It binds to the 23S RNA of the 50S subunit of the ribosome. So it's just a review. And remember that it's bacteriostatic. So it prevents the growth of bacteria without destroying them. Bacteria is still needed vaginally. I was watching, I don't know if anyone watches, but um, Seeking Sister Wives, it's a show, a reality show that I really like. And so this is where they have multiple female partners for the one male. And she says, well, if you're gonna have sex with my husband, we have to have the same pH balance vaginally. And so she makes the new sister wife have a vaginal steam so that she can kill all the bacteria that's not in the same pH as her, is her thinking, right? So they both do this vaginal steam, which is crazy. And my 19 year old walks in, he says, what are you watching? And it's these two women vaginally steaming. And I was like, it's just a show. They're just trying to get their, their vaginal pH the same. And so, yeah, he walks out and so, it just really interests me what people think, right? The douching that they do. And so I think people think one thing, but um, I'm not really sure where they get their information from. So now that she's done the bacterial vaginal steam, it's safe for the sister wife to have sex with the husband and everybody can be sleeping with the husband. And then it's a big circle and she's now a sister wife is the thought behind it. So. Has anyone seen that show? Raise your hand if you've seen the show. Okay, a couple people, so. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, so there was a study, because as I was trying to present this information, and I did present this information to pharmacists a couple months ago, um, there was a study, and um, I wanted to look at, well, what, what do we recommend to you all as providers, right? We have all these different therapies on the market, metronidazole, metronidazole gel, Clinda cream, Clinda gel. This study, and this is not, you know, the only study that's out there. There's several other studies to try to find out what's the most effective, or at least what would be a go-to. This study looked at 100 women and found, again, equally efficacious 
in treating, but patients were most satisfied with the vaginal treatments. They most wanted to use a vaginal gel or cream, probably because um, they could just do it vaginally. They didn't have to take anything orally. Most of them are one and done. Um, and they could probably do it right before they go to bed and they don't even feel anything, no side effects, no GI issues. And so to me, that seems like it would be a go-to if you have that option when you're prescribing. Okay, and patients call all the time and they say, oh, I've lost my applicator. And then it's like, oh gosh, I don't really know what to do for that. If you lose your cream applicator or a gel applicator, I don't have extra applicators sitting around in the pharmacy. This comes in the box. And so um, all I can do is request from you all a refill for another one, another cream with applicator. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an issue if a patient has a tendency to do that. We have a 26 year old female patient who suffers from depression. She's tried many first and second line therapies in the class, including cognitive behavior therapy, <coughs> excuse me, but she's been unable to have sustained improvements from her depression. She comes into your office today requesting a new therapy. She wants to find something because she's tired of feeling this way. And I'm sure you get patients all the time, right? This is their appointment with you. This is their saving grace. You're gonna fix it um, with this one appointment. I recently went to um, one of our dispensaries because I was trying to tour to figure out what's gonna happen when all of these patients go to get cannabis and think that it's gonna treat all of their problems. So the dispensaries I think need to tell patients that this is for symptoms. This is not gonna treat problems. Um, it's not cures, it's for symptom treatment. Um, and even that it's not gonna treat symptoms of several different ailments. Um, and the dispensaries that I have talked to, they're very clear that this does not treat issues or cure issues. It's just for symptom treatment. So I hope that patients are understanding that when they come to you. Um, but MJ is not currently nor planning on becoming pregnant, has no substance abuse or misuse. According to the American Psych Association, SSRIs or SNRIs or tricyclics, which I'm not a fan of, I'm not, never gonna recommend as a first line agent because they do have some of the sedative effects. Um, would be your first line therapy, according to, to guidelines. So what would be an option for a patient that comes in and has some depression and wants you all to fix it for her? Um, so this is, oh, yes. Is it a hard pharmacology question? Cause, okay. Okay, I just wanna know what a vaginal seam is. I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one. It was like a box and they put some hot rocks underneath and then you sat on it like a little commode and the steam comes up through the box. And they were, they were actually seemed a little painful. And so I'm I think not, I'll it was pass. like a hot box for your hot box for your vagina. Okay, so for this patient, we're going to recommend Spravato. Um, this is a nasal spray. And so um, it is a new therapy that um, isn't approved for, of course, pediatric patients or the elderly or during pregnancy. Um, there's no dosage adjustment for renal or hepatic functions. Esketamine is the generic name of this therapy, and it is over $300 per nasal spray device. You may have seen some commercials for this on TV. This would be something that would be in office only so that you would prescribe and then actually give to patients because it is a REMS drug. So you'd have to be an approved prescriber dispenser of this therapy because there is a period of time where you have to observe the patient. Um, this is one of the reasons why, for instance, Community pharmacies didn't really give a lot of the COVID monoclonal antibodies. You were supposed to observe the patient for an hour after giving it. And so um, other drugs that we don't give um, where we have to observe, I don't really have the means in a community pharmacy 
to do that and to monitor patients. So generally speaking, this would be one that would be an office only. The dosing on this is quite complicated. I wouldn't expect you to memorize it. If you're going to, or if a patient says, I really wanna try this therapy, it worked in my friend, um, you got everything, the prior auth approved, you think it's a good option for the patient, um, you would have to look up what you're treating and then that appropriate dosage for the patient. It should be used um, in conjunction with oral antidepressants and it is a C3. It's a non-selective and non-competitive NMDA receptor antagonist, um, and it is not known how the antidepressant effects work. We do have NMDA receptors on the brain, so I'm assuming it works similar to some of the other antidepressant uh, medications where we have the receptor on the brain, it then goes in and um, can actually increase dopamine. And so um, that would generally to me be how it would work. Um, we must monitor for two hours because the risk of sedation and dissociation is what the FDA has it listed as. And again, you'd have to be signed up as a REM site before you could prescribe and give that drug. The next one is for ADHD. We have a 12 year old. So let's say a 12 year old comes to your clinic. Mom says, she can't focus. I think she needs something. She's doing bad in all her schoolwork, just can't get her homework done. Stimulants would be the first line agent according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, which most of you might start for your patient, um, whether she failed it or maybe you don't wanna go with the stimulant route. There are several medications that are stimulants that we have, methylphenidate, amphetamines, but you know as well as I, we have had significant back order problems at the pharmacy. Oxycodone's been on back order, amphetamines have been on there. Um, I want you to know personally, I don't control what comes in and what doesn't come in from the DEA. They send me what they send me. And oftentimes I'll say, have your doctor send in two five milligram oxycodones instead of a 10, <clears throat> because I can't change what's on the e-script, right? And so if you send in two of the fives, one twice a day, I can fill that, but I can't fill the tens because those are on back order. So also I can't transfer the script for a control if it's filled at my pharmacy, that's a federal law. So my hands are really tied when you send something in to me because it's the patient's default pharmacy and I don't have it. Um, and it's the first time they're ever getting it. I can transfer non-C2s once it's been filled once at my pharmacy, but for the first fill, it has to be filled at least one time at the pharmacy you send it to. Okay, any questions about that? Yes. I can delete it, yes, uh, but that's all I can do. And I will not automatically delete it unless you call me. I'll store it and put it on hold because I won't know that you've e-prescribed in a second one to a different pharmacy, unless I specifically investigate and look. So let's say you e-prescribed two fives or a 10 to CVS, right? Cause they have it. I wouldn't know that I have no information on CVS's system. So what I'll do with the 10 that was on back order you e-prescribed to me, I'll put on hold. And what that does is it allows the patient to get that prescription at any time for up to six months. So you're leaving it open to that patient coming back and calling me a month later and saying, oh, there's a prescription on hold, I'll get that, where you intended for it to be canceled and called it over to CVS. So it really does leave it vulnerable to the patient getting it twice um, if they call and start questioning what's on hold in their profile. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's important to make sure somebody communicates with me just as simple as a voicemail. You know, I called Mr. Smith's or I e-prescribed Mr. Smith's new Oxy over to CVS, please cancel the old one. And then I, I will be able to delete it. And I don't know if you guys can, can you recall prescriptions back and, and cancel? No. So yeah, that's gonna be an issue. So Calbri or Veloxazine is gonna be the drug I'm talking about here. And this is dosage adjustment. Oh, sorry. 
a second. I just want to reiterate that or make sure I clarify that point. So if we send in a controlled substance through our e-script to Walgreens, right? you don't have it. Right. Patient calls and says, hey, they don't have it. Can you send me another script to CVS? And we send in another script. There's two open scripts. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. And I'll store it. And, uh, you know, I can store it and it'll stay in their profile for six months. Once the six months is up, if I do try to fill it, it'll say prescription too old. And I wouldn't be able to fill it without re-getting your permission. But yeah, absolutely. Do I need to do that? All I can do is just delete it. I don't have like a way to notify you electronically or, and it's like a manual deletion. It, like a notice or something. Um, I don't know that I've ever gotten it. Does it come like an email or something? Just kidding. I'm going to say that it should, but I don't know that I've ever received a, a notification that says delete. So I don't know if the system automatically deletes it, but I don't do anything to delete it. Yeah. Do you have to call the pharmacist or can you call the pharmacy tech? The pharmacy tech is fine. Okay, great. And you could, like I said, you could leave me a voicemail, um, just anything to get the information that that should be deleted. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, you're good. He says it's good. Okay. So if you didn't want to go um, for the C2 um, for this patient, veloxacine is um, an option. And I just want to go to the next slide. So the non-stimulant medications that are FDA approved for ADHD are listed down here. We have Stratera, uh, Guanfacine, Intuniv. Well, this is basically 10X, but extended release, um, which is still a control, but not a C2. Clonidine, and then now we have Calbri. So those might be some options to start a patient on, especially if you have mom or dad that doesn't want to start with amphetamine or another agent um, that, uh, that they may have to be a control two substance. This is basically an SNRI. Um, and so I have a picture on the next slide and the side effects are very similar to the other antidepressant medications that we see in children. So the warning of suicidal thoughts and the SNRI blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine. Um, so that'd be similar to other antidepressants as well. We have a 55 year old male patient who takes daily aspirin for prevention of cardiovascular disease. This is basically gonna be your patient who has heard about um, the commercials of Vazalor that we see on TV, they did some really hard marketing. It dropped off a little bit, but when it first came out, I saw the commercials on TV. Patients came in kind of asking about GI issues, wanting me to recommend Vazalor instead of their regular aspirin. It was difficult, right? Because I'm saying here's a $2 therapy versus a $12 therapy. Um, and so the American College of Cardiology guidelines say that consider aspirin to be a second line agent for prevention of cardiovascular disease. In recent years, the daily use of aspirin has been recommended um, against due to increased risk of GI bleeding. But um, recent studies have shown no reduction in recurrent thromboembolic events. But I do wanna say, regardless of that, compared to placebo, they've also shown a difference in bleeding or other serious adverse events if you were on both of those. So there may still be some benefit to taking aspirin 
it doesn't look like there's other harms that a patient is going to get. So they may still get some benefits from that aspirin. I'm not a fan of a patient not taking aspirin or stopping aspirin. Okay, so again, there may have not been a reduction in thromboembolic events, but there was a clear reduction in the occurrence of other serious cardio cardiovascular events. And regardless whether you think an aspirin helps or not, we didn't see any decrease in adverse effects and we didn't see any increase in bleeding um, from these studies that, um, that I'm talking about here. We did see a small reduction in mortality. Um, and so I still, when patients are on it and they're stable on it, tell patients continue taking it. I would never tell a patient to stop taking it. I do let pharmacists know, and especially the students, because I teach at the college, before we do a lot of medication therapy management, before you recommend a patient should start taking it though, I would really have them talk to their provider. Uh, because even though it's just over the counter and we're recommending multivitamins and calcium with vitamin D, aspirin is a little bit different and we don't have their full electronic health record. So I don't usually recommend over the counter aspirin for everybody with diabetes or at an increased risk of cardiovascular event. I do suggest they talk to their provider and I would rather have that discussion first. It's very hard to recommend things for a patient when I don't have their electronic health record or their lab values. It's like trying to put together pieces of the puzzle and starting from the middle of the puzzle. Um, so I do let, let pharmacists and pharmacy students know but aspirin's not one of the ones where I just say, yeah, just go ahead and start. I might've done that five or 10 years ago, but this is one where I think a discussion with the provider um, to ensure that there's no other risks is important. So March 1st of 2021, Vasalor uh, was approved and came to the market. And your patients, again, may have seen on TV. I know if they've ever bought any vitamins on Amazon, it will actually come up in their search now because they have such great marketing. So it kind of knows that that's a patient um, that would benefit from an Amazon commercial. And so if you look on Amazon, a 12 count is like 12 bucks and it, it's probably something that would flag for them. I know I oftentimes buy vitamins on Amazon and Basilor sometimes comes up on that right side of the screen under my checkout. So um, it, it's something that's kind of making them aware, hey, we sell this. It shouldn't be used if there's a recent history of stomach or, or intestinal bleeding, or if a patient's had a history of NSAIDs. This is from the Vesalor package insert if you want the dosing, <clears throat> but basically it's specific to their indication. The one thing that I really think is neat about Vesalor, and I don't know that I've ever tried this, but this is what the manufacturer is claiming because this is from their website. Okay. So if reflux occurs, the excipients return to the stomach and the complex reassembles to limit contact to the mucosa. So I know it kind of, it, it seems cool to me and I think in my head, so you're saying if a patient has GI reflux, right? And then um, the, for whatever reason, the drug kind of comes back up into their esophagus, instead of causing any kind of bleed, or acidity, the drug complex comes back together, um, kind of like a regurgitation of the drug complex. I haven't actually tried it in vitro or in a glass or anything like that, but um, I don't know. Something's going on with this computer here. Hold on one second. So yeah, that's, that's basically what the drug company was claiming. I think it would be a cool experiment um to try but i've tried experiments with baking and they've never worked out so um yeah this is all from the vasalor manufacturer website antiplatelet activity they're claiming better than aspirin same thing with upper gi damage again you're going from two dollars for a hundred to a dollar a pill essentially so it's a big difference if a patient comes to your clinic that's specifically complaining about this, yeah, I think it's worth a shot. Um, I don't know if it uh, will, will solve the problem, but I think it, it really might be beneficial for a patient that's having issues specifically with the aspirin or has had an adverse effect with aspirin in the past. Okay, 
We have CB, a 10 year old who collapsed while he was about to take a tour of a chocolate factory. Basically his blood sugar was low because he skipped breakfast and was just trying to hold off so he could eat all the chocolate he wanted, experienced loss of consciousness. Patient was on Traceba and Novolog. What new therapy might be an option for our patient? Um, and so glucagon we know is out there. I don't see it a lot at the community level, but I'm glad to say I also work inpatient at the VA and it's tagged on to every sliding scale. So every sliding scale that I approve there, there's a glucagon, there's a dextrose um, syringe. And then of course it's linked on to the lab orders, which is great. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Oh, and glucose tablets. So all of those are linked as a standing order uh, because what was happening is it, one would get prescribed and the others would get forgotten. And so it's nice that if someone puts a sliding scale in, all those other orders will flag. Hopefully you have that at your clinic um, if that's the case, but I almost never dispense glucagon emergency kits at the community pharmacy anymore. Um, so I thought this was interesting that they're still vesting money in drugs for low blood sugar. And of course, the American Diabetes Association says glucagon should be prescribed for anyone at increased risk of hypoglycemia. And then the high risk populations is defined here. So Zegalog, which is basically for low blood sugar specifically, um, is now approved and available. Um, it's $370 per syringe. And then the mechanism, it's just a glucagon receptor agonist. So it activates the hepatic glucagon receptors, which cause the breakdown of glycogen, which then results in the liver, which releases a bunch of glucose into the blood. So the same process that we would see um, for just regular glucagon drug. 10 minutes after um, is when it should begin working. And then the contraindications are listed here, basically a tumor on the adrenal glands or a tumor on the pancreas. Okay, BPH, and I'll, I know I'm running out of time, so I just wanna go really quick. The new drug, American Neurology Association says the guidelines for BPH, as I'm sure you know, are basically uh, five uh, uh, ARIs, which is gonna be PROSCAR, and then um, the five phosphodiesterase type five inhibitors and then just a regular pro, uh, prostate versus an enlarged prostate. And TADFI, which is Proscar and Cialis, was approved as one um, specific tablet. Mechanism is listed there. Seizures, so this is a girl who presents to the clinic with a seizure, chief complaint of seizures. I do wanna say that when you have patients that are on cannabis, some patients can have cannabis-induced seizures, so please rule that out on your differential. There are some strains that could cause that in patients. Um, and then just to kind of show you the American Academy of Neurology guidelines for new onset, this is Eprontia. It's a topiramate oral solution. And so that is now FDA approved um, if you have a specific patient that it might be good for. Uh, let's see, there was one more drug I wanted to, oh, I think that's it. So new therapies not only reveal treatment gaps in care, but they can also have many um, warnings as well. I think that we need to stay aware of new therapies and then also um, make sure that we let patients know there could be significant cost issues, prior authorization issues. It seems like most of the new therapies weren't really new. They were old therapies, and then they just kind of tacked on some new advances onto them. Um, and so you may not have to learn as much about mechanisms as you would think. It may just be more of a review of how these drugs actually work. Um, so in, in summary, this is a constant learning profession, which I'm sure you know. Um, for me, I have to constantly review guidelines. And so that's why I think it's important to just always look up again and again as to what I'm dispensing and recommending for patients. Um, and then also now that we have medical cannabis out there and some significant enzyme interactions, 
what is it going to be in terms of side effects when a patient takes cannabis with those drugs? Um, we see some interactions with CYP3A4 and um, CYP2A9. So those are going to be some significant interactions. So we have to fully equip ourselves with um, the counseling points so that we can tell patients and rule those out if a patient comes in with some new onset side effects. Um, is there any questions for me about any of the new drugs that we talked about or anything um, not related to the new drugs that I can answer? For that, Amy, I think we do have time for questions, but I ask you to raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. Sure. This is a question about the ES ketamine that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that the same of the IV ketamine that people use for conscious sedation and things like that, just a nasal spray? Yes, uh huh, absolutely. Okay. Yes, it is. That's a good question. And it's better you guys than me because you're all going to be doing it in the office and I'm not able to do it in the pharmacy. I can imagine people in line for that. So, yeah they'll probably get the REMS approval for it. Because what's the one that you can do in clinic, the injection, it's not naloxone of Vivitrol. I can't do that at Walgreens either. I can't dispense it, carry it or inject it. So it hasn't been a helpful therapy for me at all. I think it was your last drug that you mentioned, topramate. Yes. Is there any difference between what we've been giving? No. Have you been given? Well, it's a liquid. Oh, okay. But that was the only difference. Yeah. And then um, it blocks the same three. Re it's the same three receptors that the the others have been getting. So no, there was no difference. Yeah, that's a good question. I had to look up these three receptors because I wasn't really sure of them. So GABA, um, AMPA, which is a very long drug name, what AMPA stands for. Um, it was so long, I didn't even want to cut and paste it. And um, Kinate. So if you look at those three receptors on the brain, they all look very similar and they're all affected by, um, by a topiramate. And so it's a very old drug in a very new way. And so I'm sure the liquid will be expensive, but if you have a patient that is unable to do it, then it could be an option. Yeah, that is a good question. And I'm not carrying it right now because I have not seen a script for it yet. Any other questions? And these were just the new drugs that I picked. I mean, there is, I could have gone with several others. There's tons of biosimilars on the market. Um, and I know that there's some issues with getting the biosimilars covered and having that transition of the prior auth. Um, I'm having the same issues as well. Um, the prior auths are a big you know, problem for us. On any given day, I have third party rejects. I think yesterday I had 150 third party rejects. And what this means, I have 150 prescriptions stuck in my computer that are not filled, um, that are either rejected by the insurance and I'm waiting on either you all to call the insurance to try to get it approved or you've called and I'm waiting for the insurance to make a decision to resubmit the claim. So, you know, 150 and we're doing about 700 a day. That's a pretty big percentage of prescriptions where a patient is not getting their therapy or their care. So I understand you know, that that's a big problem as well. We're having the same, you know, issues and struggles as you. I did identify a formulary app um, that you can kind of go in and check to see if it's preliminarily covered on the insur insurance, but it's not, you know, always up to date. 
Any other questions? Yes. What is that app that you're talk you just talked about? So if you go to your um, app store and you look up formulary, it looks like a flower. Um, and I can send it to Rachel as well. I teach the PA school and I presented it to them because they were really frustrated with it. And you have to know the patient's insurance and it's like a, it's like a rainbow colored flower. Um, you can probably look at it. So I just, I plugged in, I did app store, formulary app, and then it was just a rainbow colored flower. I'll send it to you, Rachel, and then you can disseminate. And if there might be better ones out there. I was just looking for something to try to figure out what's covered and what's not. Um, especially with vaccines, I've been having a lot of problems with patients thinking a vaccine is covered um, because, you know, there's information out there that vaccines must be covered, but then there's also gaps in that and loopholes okay, a vaccine up to 64 has to be covered in clinic, but then when a patient turns 65, it's considered a prescription item. And then there's co-pays and there's also non-network pharmacies. And so there's all kinds of gaps in why a vaccine might not be covered. So it's been really frustrating um, with that as well. Anything else? Thanks everyone and I appreciate your time.